Wayne Dowson from Wayne Dowson Fine Art. And this young chap here served with the RAAF in New Guinea. His name? George Curley Taylor. And he's a character. Recently, Curley's daughter Sandra invited Jackie and I down to Delegate to interview 98-year-old Curley for our Anzac series. Please enjoy part one. I'm Curley Taylor, and this is the story of my life. I was born in Brisbane. I remember that. I can't tell you where, though. What about your father, Curley? He's a puppy. Yeah. He, was a, he was a windjammer sailor bloke, and he jumped ship here in Australia. That's how he, he, was, he came to be here, yeah. He, but he was, in his own way, a clever man. He was a tough man. Uh, for instance, he was working in an iron mark, uh, a place where they built uh, roofing iron and all that sort of stuff. And he, I'm going to tell you how tough he was, see. And he had a whole stack of it and he was trying to push it up on the high and like that, see. And it slipped and it cut him right across there and his nose fell down. He just held it up, walked 120 yards to where there was an ambulance and had it all sewn up. That night he played the drums in the, for the dance band because he couldn't, he couldn't afford not to be there. Now, do you want to know how tough he is? <laughs> and when he went bang, <laughs> the bells rang, the stars shone. <laughs> Tell us about your mother. Where'd she come from? In Brisbane. Now, she came from a family of, um, in England, but they weren't English. Liverpool. The Liverpool Irish, they were Catholics, the whole mood of them. I met them all after that, the grandmothers, the grandmothers, the grandmothers yeah, from here, from here, from here. She was one of a large family of 12. It was a pretty tough times in those days. My mother had a sister, and they both had six kids. They lived two suburbs away, apart, see? and they both died almost at the same time. So you looked after your sisters and brothers after your mum died? Yeah. 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 So the two of them. Yeah. yeah. So what the did you... The boy and the girl. Yeah. He was just a toddler, you know, and she was one year old. Yeah, oh, yes, I, there was nobody else to do it, you know. The, 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 the women he called in wouldn't have them to do with those babies, see. Although there was another little story that he got one woman to come in there, a little tiny funny thing, and uh, there were three of us all in one bed in the, in the, in the room, and she had a little light about that high with a white bowl, see? And she says, come on boys, it's time to go to bed. We were, <laughs> we were pissing ourselves laughing, and they said, fancy having a light to go to bed. <laughs> but she didn't last long either, none of them lasted long, see, until her stepmother come along, see. Yeah, well, she didn't come as her stepmother, she was an old maid, see. But she came, he married her, he had sense enough to marry her, see. She was a very good housewife. Of course, I never got on with her because she had a, uh, and then you used to idolise, see, and I used to belt shit out of me. <laughs> of course I got idle when he had come home, see. But she did, did have a lot of good, in a way. Uh, she wanted to go on. Uh, Sam and I used to, at, in the kitchen, we had the kitchen, see. And it was a, a, a wash basin here with a tap over it. And there was a stove in that end, you know. And in the wintertime you could stand in behind it because the wood stove seemed to get warm. But we had to go in there and wash up. I, I'm stacking up, you know, and if we bumped him in here, she came running in with a stick, bang, around the legs, you know. Well, that sort of thing. But this is what hurt us, Sam and I, see. She had a, wh a whip on the wall just inside the door, see. And when we finished, you know, we'd sneak up, little tell us, and we'd say, we're finished, Auntie. And this is, we never forgot this. The first thing to do is he reached for the whip to get to look at the, to see what sort of a job we'd done. And you know, Sam told his kids that I told, they never forgot that, you know. Yeah. We finished out here. Bang! <laughs> but she was like this. Very 100% strict. On the other hand, she taught me to cook. See, the difference in the... Of course, when you sat up at the dinner table, she had a switch and a stick. You, you did something wrong, bang! See? You soon learned how to sit at the table. I could go and dine with the bloody King and Queen of England. And, uh, you know, the way she, she raised us. So the first time you left home, you were 12? Yeah, I went to, I went to work on a dairy farm out of Odessa. I, I won a scholarship, see? And I should have went to high school. Not high school, the next one above. They don't have that anymore. But he wouldn't let me, see? Uh, he couldn't afford it, you see? I'm the eldest of, of a heap of kids all starving, more or less, see? So he, he, he saw an ad in the paper, see? And he went and saw this bloke who lived two streets away. <coughs> and they arranged for me to go work for his son 
and so I'm a dairy farm, see? But he got the money, not me, <laughs> five shillings a week. But he took me on the train and away I went, see? Yeah, we, 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 we milked 42 ca cows a day between us, this, and he was about six foot tall, this bloke, and a drunken bum, see? Uh, and I had to cook for him and, and wash the clothes and, and all this. Well, he, he got, after I'd been here a while, see? But now, I've got to stop the story because this is important. My father never ever rang up to see how I was going. I, in the end, I was only living in, in, in sugar bags. I had no clothes. Anyhow, this fellow started going into the desert to play football and he wouldn't come home for two or three days. Now, you can imagine me, have a look at me, see? That, that age, milk at 42 gallons uh, twice a day, and then there was four big cans of cream that I couldn't lift, and, and I had to drag them across the road, they would never have a slidery, and get them out on the road for the bloke to pick up, a, you see? So this went on and on and on, and this particular night, no, no, I was later than usual, see? And the bloke, the, come in to see me. We had to cross a creek, you know, about that deep in water. He came to see me, he said, I just finished in the last cow, see. And he said, well, you finish that? And he said, oh. now forget the rest. Now I'm going to give you some good advice. You, you've been neglected. Your father's not looking after you, and this stupid bugger is not treating you right, yeah. Pack your few things. I said, I've got no things. I've got them on. Well, that's what I'm talking about, he said and come with me. Now he said, I'll take you home to my place and you can have a bar and I'll find you some reasonable clothes and I'll find you a better job than this. And then I said, he said, then, then I'll tell the police I've got you. That man took me home for the night and the next day he got me a job at the dairy farm just at, at that town. The police come out and saw me and I said, well, you go and talk to the bloke that brought me here. Well, he said, that's who we're looking for. And he told him, see. So they went and talked to him. And then they came back there and talked to that farmer, see. And they all praised me up. And, and the policeman said, now it's this way, Mr. Taylor. You write and tell your father you've done no wrong, see, but you've got no clothes. You've got to lie to him. You have my permission. <laughs> And now he said, don't send them any more money. You've got to look after yourself. We'll do the rest. So that's what happened. I, I worked there, saved me money. He, he, but I did eventually go back home. I was going out west. I met the man at that farm, see, who was telling me I was wasting my time on a dairy farm, see. As I told you, even as a boy, through my fatherhood, I learned to be handy, see. And I was wasting my time working for five shillings a week on a dairy farm, that's what he said. And he said, I'm going out west and uh, I'll help you out there. He said, he said, you'll make money out there, not, not what you're getting here. So anyhow, I went. I finished up when above Charleville, that's Western Queensland. See. And uh, by then now, I'm working in shearing sheds. Not shearing, but working in shearing sheds. See. And how old are you there? How oh, old are you? 14 or 15, mm. something like that. About I'd say I'd be about 15 by the time I got out west, see. We were, we were taking out this shed, three, three shearers and four other blokes, and it was all uh, old-fashioned stuff. We unloaded uh, tarpaulas to put over the framework for the, for the cookhouse and the kitchen, and then there was a place for the camp ovens to cook in, and uh, then they, they uh, fixed up the shearers and the accommodation and so forth, and, then, and, and, and all the tucker was put in a shed, see, and, and on shelves, and then I said, somebody said, who's the cook? And they, he said, Taylor. And I never cooked for anybody like I could cook. But I had never cooked for a mob of people like that, see. And when you're cooking for shearers, you have to cook to the minute. They come, and you slave your guts out, and you've got all the tucker laid out, and they come tearing over and fight. They're the greatest gormandizers you've ever seen, hungry shearers. And in no time at all they've got, and you're stuck there with two hours bloody washing up, getting everything cleaner. And you're not only get it all finished, you've got to get ready for the next bloody meal. They're hungry bastards want a meal every couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> and I went on from there. As, as a temporary cook, but a learner shearer. And I became a good shearer. How did you meet your wife, Curly? That's, that's a ticklish question how I met my wife. I mean, I didn't meet her, she grabbed me. I come back to share for the same bloke, see? That's right, down that way. 
So we got to know each other a bit then, see. So the, the, the next year I had a motor car, Ford V8 motor car, but, but, but I came down from Queensland, right down through New South Wales, in the middle of New South Wales, then I went up the Murray River, and down Big Western Victoria, and right round and got to Melbourne. I wasn't coming to Delhi yet. But when they got there, uh, we couldn't pick up any work, see. Uh, there was another bloke with me, I was giving him, he was a wool class and I was a shearer, see. And we couldn't, we never got any work at all, so. Uh, so when we got to Melbourne, I diced him, see. I said, you've got to go you paddle your own canoe now. I said, where are you going? I said, there's only one place I can go. That, it's a town called Delegate. So, so I come up, see, and I was only five minutes in the bloody boarding house when somebody said, are you looking for a shearer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I, I went out to uh, that way, yeah. Can't forget the name of it. And I came back. Well, we were yak and yak, yak, yak. Yeah. So she just asked me straight out, are you going to marry me or not? I'm sick of writing letters. And I said, well, yeah, so we did. <laughs> That's how easy a man can be trapped, see? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please.